So the questions we're going to deal with today deal with what are the effects of digital disruption on organizations, what does it mean to us, and what can we do about it? So one of the things that I will ask you to do is to open your mind for a minute about these subjects, because you've had some incredible speakers this morning who have done a really good job of laying out the landscape, including at the end here with Ari, uh, that you're dealing with a really difficult problem. So I want to I want to ask you to open your mind and and start thinking about context. So one of the things we're going to do in a, now is to start thinking about context. So let's turn to AI for a minute, artificial intelligence. There and I know you know this, there are those that believe that AI will replace many of us if not all of us in the workplace. There are also those who think that they AI will eventually replace all of us and Hollywood has not done a very good job of uh, dissuading us of that. And there's also a belief that AI will become so powerful it will become superhuman in its capabilities and then we as whatever we are at that point will be at the mercy of the AI. And if you want to really scare yourself, here are a couple of books uh, to read, one by Kurzweil, the other by Bostrom that go into the specifics of this and in Bostrom's case go into a little bit about what are the potential remedies that you could deal with. But I don't share the gloomy view that AI is going to take over and become all powerful. And I'm just going to use the Y2K example for those of you that were in the workplace during Y2K. We, we approached the year 2000. We thought the systems were not properly programmed for the change for going from 199. 1999 to 2000. And the enterprise systems we thought were going to crash, financial services, your organizations, we thought were going to shut down. A lot of work was done. Most things didn't go badly like we were worrying about they did. We got our way through it. I think we're going to see that, that the world of artificial intelligence and how we use it is the same. As long as we stay ahead of it, it will be fine, just like we were in, in Y2K. But I think to try to understand these issues that we're facing and to put this into context, talk a little bit about a couple of trends that we've seen over time, some sweeping societal changes. So let's examine two quickly. The first one was the agricultural age. Some people like to call these things revolutions. I don't particularly like the term revolution because I don't think it, it properly articulates what happened. But what changed here during the agricultural age was we changed how we grew things. And what that caused was we changed then what we grew and then basically how people lived. Uh, and the one positive thing that came out of this was the division of labor. We figured out how to keep all of us from being hunter-gatherers and allow us to take and divide up the work so that we could all live um, by each one of us taking a specialty. What that did was it allowed us to then begin living in social collectives. It allowed us to live in villages, cities, towns, well not cities then, but they eventually developed into towns and cities. But, uh, and this was the beginnings of what we call today business. It was trade. That's how formalized trade began, was when you started having this division of labor. The serious negative that came out of this was disease. Basically, because I know you all know this, so I'm just re recounting our, our history here a bit, but it, it was disease because we did not do a good job of dealing with waste products. So it's not a good idea to have waste running down the middle of the street. Um, so disease became the big negative. So the second major societal change we all dealt with was the industrial age. And this was the, this was where it changed, not, the first one was changed what we grew. This one, is a, this one was about what we made and how we made things. And as a result changed what we made and then again changed our life in a dramatic way. Um, this was the early use of technology. So even back in that period, we were beginning to figure out technology and start to use it. 
and as a result, significant wealth was being developed uh, during that period. So what did we do with this technology? We created machines, we put these machines into factories, and then we had a serious negative emerge. So just like the disease of the agricultural age, the negative here was the worker health. So none of these, and I know you all know this, but none of these things developed around the world. They developed in pockets. Um, in this particular point, it, these, the, this type of, this part of the age developed in, the, in what we now know of as Britain, moved to the United States, especially in the south, southern part of the United States was developed in the textile industry. That was where this machine idea started to develop. And as a result, there was a great deal of pollution that was created inside these factories that affected people's lungs. And so we ended up with this issue of worker health. We also had the issue of worker safety because we didn't know how to properly deal with these machines, and so people were being hurt. Now, I, I would just say, unfortunately, we all know that these same two big negatives exist today in many parts of the world. We still haven't fixed them there. We need to. So this tour through history was interesting, but how does it help us understand what we're going through today? So I think there's a parallel here. I think there's a common theme. It's disruption. Disruption, it changed our lives and how we live our lives. We went from being hunter-gatherers to then people that lived in cities with division of labor, and then we started seeing automation, and we started dealing with all these negative effects that are coming out. Fundamentally, it changed how we live. So let's take a moment and define this term disruption. So what is disruption? To me, disruption is a major change, a serious change. Something big that changes, uh, that's lasting. And it changes a market, a business model, an organization. And when you then say, well, what is digital disruption? Digital disruption is just doing it with digitization, data systems, um, and so forth. So then there's a term that people use also called transformation. So transformation to me is what happens after you've had a big disruption. So disruption is like where you drop the rock in a pond and you start seeing everything change. It changes the way you see the water. And then transformation is what happens later. It's how you deal with the disruption that you have. I would just tell you that you can make a distinction between those two. I like them because if you think, if let's use the example of Uber, because that's one most people understand. What Uber did, people could say that Uber disrupted a market, and it clearly did. But what it did is it changed our way of thinking about the business model for the way we deal with assets, right? Whether you own a car or you own a taxi, it just changed our way of thinking about it. That's what disruption is. Transformation was then, where the folks at Airbnb said, you know what, we could take that same thing and do it over here to this one. And a bunch of people, and if you sit in the classes that we have at Columbia, I teach one on entrepreneurism. Um, you have a lot of entrepreneurs who want to disrupt. They want to disrupt, they want to disrupt. And I'm going, okay, that's great. But I don't think disruption happens very often. Uh, I think what happens is a lot of transformation using disruptive ideas, somebody else's ideas. And I think it's important to make that distinction because disruption to me is about where you're, you're actually making things better. Um, excuse me, transformation is about making things better. Disruption is about changing something, and that change could be not for good, right? It could be for bad. I would just say also entrepreneurs, like, you know, half of my career was in large organizations, and then I left to go build businesses, and I built software businesses for 15 or so years. Um, those of us that have done that, we love the term on, of disruption because it's an aggressive term rather than what seems like a tame term, transformation. So you don't hear a lot of entrepreneurs saying, oh, I'm going to go tr be a transformative uh, entrepreneur. But the question is here, what are we seeing in this world of technology that we're living through? Are we seeing just a lot of market disruptions, or are we seeing a major, major disruption, something really significant? 
I call this an extraordinary disruption. So let's look at the indicators. I think what we're seeing is we've all become, or our organizations have become digital organizations. I think we have built a digital platform and we are now functioning on top of a digital platform. I think that's a huge change. And you know what what I think we're seeing is that what is we have through the use of data and systems to manage that data and then accessibility we've built this digital platform. So you're no longer and I'll, let me use a hospital system. You're no longer a hospital system that functions in functions to deliver care. You're not. You're a, an organization that's sitting on top of a digital platform and you're running a hospital system on top of that digital platform. And that's, I think, a big change. I think the two major pieces are this concept of data and access. That's what's caused this to happen. And we built a, you know, a, a situation now where data is coming from everywhere. You know, I could pull up an app on my phone here and it would say where my car is parked, how much gas I have, and whether the doors are locked. So I now have a car that's providing data. I also have access to that data through a, a, an application that Jeep has for me. So the combination of data and access has given me power. I mean, whoever knew we were gonna get our cars providing us data remotely when I'm in a conference, a conf beautiful atrium here in Lincoln Center. So we have, we have two things going on. We have almost, it seems like, almost everything that's providing data to us. And at the same time, we now have systems that allow us to access that data and make sense of it. And, they're, and both are growing at astronomical levels because now you've got your refrigerator that will send diagnostic devices, uh, information if you want, your television sets, your handheld devices. So it's expanding at, at incredible rates, both in terms of the amount of data that's being created, and by the way, I'm ignoring scientific data. I'm just taking scientific, so let's take astronomy out of the game. Because when you look at what the Hubble, telecraft, Hubble spacecraft is, Hubble telescope is providing, it's grabbing enormous amounts of data that would say that we're even expanding more than logarithmic growth in the amount of data. And then we've created now an accessibility. And again, I would say, as I say this, I caution you to, to know that it doesn't exist everywhere. And I know you know that. We happen to be fortunate that we're in the hub of highly developed society. Um, but we have access now and connectivity almost everywhere that we go through cellular networks, Wi-Fi networks that connect us into this thing called the internet. So, just like the agricultural age, just like the industrial age, what's the negative side? Well, it's what we're here for today. The most obvious one is cyber. But what is this? What is this thing called cyber? Uh, to me, the cyber, the cyber, um, the cyber attacks are an attack on our infrastructure. So if you, if you think about what we talked about a minute ago, if you, if you believe, as I do, we have built this infrastructure, this um, digital platform that we're all operating our businesses on and we're living on, what they're doing is they're attacking our infrastructure. And as you've heard from each speaker today, starting with Greg at the beginning, ending with Ari, their motivations have changed now. And they're becoming much more sophisticated and complex. And I don't have to go through the examples because you got them. But they're deepening. They're going from being mischievous, I'm a 16-year-old, 
I don't like the CIA, I'm gonna see if I can hack into the CIA. They've gone to, from that to being, to creating, wanting to create chaos. And we've all, we have all seen examples of that. And then it's moving to, I don't wanna just create chaos, I wanna create damage. And now there's financial gain, and you understood that. We talked about how you know, the Bitcoin ransom thing is playing. But there's something else happening at the same time. It's, they're also broadening. So not only are they going this way, they're going this way. So they're going from social, where they're going after, it's Greenpeace going after somebody. It's not just that anymore. It's now political, as we all know there are allegations that it's happening in our own country. We know it happens in others. And then they're also moving to, there's even some of the, some of the breaches, they have one of them in particular that has not been talked about today, I won't mention it because we're still doing some forensic work on it, but it appears it might have been for market benefit. So I could shut your business down for two full weeks and I just happen to have the ability to fulfill your business needs and they came in and swooped and it looked like they got $200 million worth of business, sustainable business, based on that hack. So we're, I think we're now moving into a, an area of business gain, not just financial asking for money or, or bribing. So what's enabling this? A lot of data, a lot of systems to make sense of the data and vast networks. Now, a point about value. Data and, and access, along with the systems and tools that we use to put that data into context, and when you have data in context, that's the definition of information. Um, that's how we create value. That's how you create value, you of all people. Um, you're highly dependent on your ability to access and function with the data. That's how you create value in your own organization. But that data and those systems have now become existential to you. If you can't access your data, if you can't function, as I was giving the example of a company that just lost $200 million worth of business, by the way, the total loss was over a billion to them. So you're talking serious money, right? We heard, we heard the average was around in the you know, four to six million dollar range. There are some of these breaches that are reaching into the billion dollar range. And I think, Deirdre, we've seen four or five around the world that we are now being able to count. A billion dollars, that's both in how much it costs you to reconstitute your infrastructure and how much business you lost. But this data and access and the systems are what is vital to you creating value, but it's also what gives bad actors the ability to go after you. And you know, these are some really serious breaches here. And I would ask you to, if you have not yet, um, there are some of these that are interesting. The one that I find the most, and it was referenced by one of our speakers, is Equifax. So let's talk about Equifax for a minute. I doubt anyone in this, in this room has a contract with Equifax. We didn't sign up with Equifax. We're not, they're not, we're not a customer of Equifax. They didn't come to me and say, hey Tom, can I go grab your data from various sources and make it available elsewhere and charge for that. But they had my data. Now, I didn't say anything about it. I didn't care. I actually did care. I actually liked it because it helped me with getting a credit card or getting a mortgage, getting a car loan. But all my data was breached. And by the way, when the inside, and I'm not telling you anything, you cannot do a public search on right now and find out. 
Once their inside executives realized they had breached data and it was going to cause a problem, they hid it from the public. And some of their executives started selling stock. Some of those executives who are now being prosecuted for insider trading, I think one of them is actually in jail. By the way, one of them was part of the systems group. When you see that kind of activity with our information, when we're not even their customer, there's a problem. So if you really want to dig into this issue, you don't have to look at all these cases, but read up on Equifax. So before we go further here, please indulge me for a minute. I want to talk about robotics and AI, but I do have a method behind my madness. I know you all probably know that I love AI, so um, I'm not doing this just, to, just for my own benefit. But let's take, let's take this. A lot of people, if you, if you ask people what they're afraid about, they're afraid about robots getting out of control. Now, why would they do that? And I'm not talking about next year. I'm talking about the futuristic point. Because they think that robots have some form of human ability, right? They, look like, they can be made to look like humans. They've got potentially a brain. They have mobility. But we all know, all, I mean, we spent all morning talking about you don't have to have any mobility to be a bad actor. Do you all have, how many of you all remember the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Do, you, do many of you all know this? Because I, I see too many young faces in here and you probably, I just look at you guys and you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, this was a movie, actually when I was young, so that means most of you all weren't born yet, but this movie had in it a computer that was running a spacecraft that was traveling from one galaxy to another. And that computer was named HAL. By the way, if you play with the, the word, the, the initials HAL, you can come up with IBM. Um, and this movie was a Kubrick movie, or is, and still a, you can still watch it. It's really interesting. But HAL was a computer inside the spacecraft, and it, it had some fundamental things. It, had, it was a computer. It had a microphone, a speaker, and a camera. That's how it functioned. And it communicated. And it was friendly. And it was helpful. But it had access to everything. Everything. All the doors, all the windows, all the systems, including the life support systems. Now, what Hal did was used machine language. The code for that is ML. So what does ML mean? That's where the machine learns on its own, or where the machine teaches itself. I sh it should really be MT, because machine language is where the machine teaches itself. So it used its ability to teach itself human, some element of human cognition. And one aspect that it taught itself was not just some element of simulated consciousness, but it also taught itself a little bit of self-preservation instinct. And so I'm not going to spoil this for you because it is worth seeing if you haven't seen it, if you're interested in this type of thing. But he made, Hal made life, and I say Hal, he, because it was a male voice, um, made life very scary and uh, tenuous for those involved. So let's just do a quick Einstein thought experiment. What happens in a worst case situation like a HAL, where you have an out of control AI? So the first thing you have to think about is what gives the AI its power? I think you already know the answer to that. So every single futurist, almost every single futurist, that has looked at this issue, and we're talking about credible people. Bostrom is a credible person, for example. So is Tegmark. Everyone say, if you have a runaway AI, what you have to do is deny them access and deny them the data. And in you know, less formal terms, pull the plug. But pulling plugs, right? That's the answer. So I would just encourage you to think data and access. 
So if you take anything away from today, think data and access, because those are not only what is causing us the value in our organizations today, but it's also what's, what's putting us at risk. And being sure that you know, um, as Greg said and others, that you have figured out the data and access thing appropriately because it serves us today and I think it'll serve us long term. So let's take a moment and just go a little bit deeper on AI. And I'm doing this again for a reason and I promise you there's a point behind this. Um, so I think of AI much like I think of a mountain. So you're approaching human cognition, the peak of the mountain, you've reached it, sorry, and the, the slope on the other side is when you're exceeding it. Now, we know we've already exceeded human cognition in certain areas. We know it's been done in playing Go, AlphaGo did it. We know it's been done in playing chess, IBM's, I think it was called Deep Blue at the time, did it. So we have very narrow situations where we've exceeded humans' ability, but it's very narrow. So let me give you the example. And I'm doing this because I think some of these terms, I really don't like the fact that they seem so esoteric. The example is this. One of the most common AIs today is Siri or, um, or Alexa. And if you were to say to either Siri or Alexa, who won the London Marathon in 1981? They could give you the answer like that. If you then follow it up with a, what I call a horizontal question, you were asking a very narrow question, right? Just like playing chess or, or playing Go. I now ask the second question, just like that. How many legs did she have? It grinds to a halt. Because I'm asking it to think horizontally. It has to now say, wait a minute, I did, does, did they have a woman's marathon? And why is he asking me about legs? Where we as human beings, we can immediately answer that question. No, we can't necessarily. We, we would probably follow it. Was there, a, was there a, a woman's marathon? And then we ask that, that question. And then we would naturally say, well, two legs, because humans have two legs. So the, the real issue with AI is how far up are you getting here, up the mountain, to human cognition? Human, a lot of AI today and a lot of AI that we can see is really narrow. Oh, it's really good and it can exceed human capabilities in some ways, but it can't do what humans are. And there's, we really don't see a lot of prospect that it's getting there anytime soon. Even now, you've got Elon Musk and Kurzweil that are saying 15 years. I would just tell you, I, I don't know, Deirdre and, and my other, you know, Oscar and Sagar, we, we're working on this stuff. We see, what, 30, 50 years minimum, 30 and 50 years. And some like Tegmark think it might be 100. If you can even get there, because we don't know what human intelligence is. We don't even know what it is. Some believe it's pattern recognition, but we don't even know. We know how the brain works, but we don't know how we think. So the, the, there's a long way to go here. Down. There's another side of this that I think the distinctions are important. There's a difference between intelligence and consciousness. My calculator has intelligence. It doesn't have consciousness, okay? A lot of AI is intelligence, not consciousness. We actually don't, again, just like intelligence, we don't really know what consciousness is. So how can we build something that has it? when we don't even know what it is. It also doesn't automatically have a self-preservation instinct. It can want to preserve itself because it's goal-oriented. And one of the best examples is, uh, you know, you send your kid out, you send a, a robot out to go get f dinner for you and the robot is mugged on the way home. It may not have a self-preservation instinct, but its goal is to bring you dinner. So it may attack the mugger to preserve itself, not, not because it wants to preserve itself like a human being does, but because its, goal, its objective was to get you dinner. 
So we need to make sure we understand these things because these are not simple things to, to, to figure out and we shouldn't be confused by Hollywood movies or scare tactics of people that write books and, and uh, do television shows. There's also a distinction that I think is important to make between the biological and the simulated, okay? I can pick this up and I can run a program that simulates a black hole and it can be pulling all the planets into that black hole. It isn't pulling me. It's not pulling me into the black hole, but it's pulling all those planets. So it's really important to understand the distinction between what is simulated and what is biological. So I do not expect you to understand this, but if you want this, I will get it to you. It is what we think is the current definition of these terms. So what is automation? What's machine learning? What's supervised and unsupervised learning? What is deep learning, right? What are neural networks? How are these, what are these terms? Because these terms are very confusing. But I, I just want to take you to one definition right here. What is the primary value of artificial intelligence? The primary value is prediction. It's ability to predict. It's ability to predict that when it, I hold this iPhone 10 up to my face, that it can distinguish my face and it's me. Image recognition. The ability to predict what you actually said to Siri. These are, that's what AI is doing, and it's actually pretty good at it in certain situations. Now, what does it take to be able to do that? It takes a large amount of data that's pre-labeled. So the, the general view is it takes 10,000 images of a cat to teach a comp an AI to recognize an image of a cat. But just like the London Marathon example that I gave you, do you, how many do you think it's going to take to recognize a dog when you're going all the way from a, from a St. Bernard to a Chihuahua? A whole lot more than 10,000. Who knows? They still haven't been able to do that one. So, and we recognize it right away. Why biological? Because our evolution has taught us to recognize these things, and we can do it like that. So in order for an AI to function well, it has to have labeled data, a lot of it. And it has to be able to be a simple task. Is that a cat or not? Did Tom just ask a question? Remember, I, it was not a multi-part question. It was a single question. And it wasn't a horizontal question, right? So keep these things in mind when you're thinking about AI applications. So what are the primary uses of AI today? Recommendation engines. Spam? Not spam. Right? Google's pretty good at that these days. Also, Amazon's recommendations, Netflix. Keep going. So recommendation engines, why? Because you keep getting a lot of data and you keep reinforcing the data. So it keeps learning what I like and what I don't like. But the one thing it's not doing is not getting motivation. So I may click on a picture of a shoe because it's a company that I think my son has an investment in from their venture fund in Boston. It didn't know that. It thought I liked the shoes. So it's now flooding me with shoes. Why? Because if we have a, let's say we've got a rheostat from one to 10, we're at about two on the sophistication of this stuff. Because we're not getting much further than the transaction. It's not getting into my motivation yet. Image recognition is doing a really pretty good job there. I would say, except some problems like dogs. Uh, but it's getting into pretty good image recognition and then speech recognition. This is the stuff. I think the opportunity is cyber. Why? Large data set, anywhere from 100 to thousands of attempted hits on your infrastructure, your digital infrastructure, every single day. And it's pretty well labeled. Bad, not bad. Now, why would you do that? You heard today from Ari and others, and we know this from the work we've done. Almost every other, all of the major cyber breaches are done because you didn't update your Cisco or your Microsoft products. You're six months behind. 
So what does, a, what does a hacker have to do? They just have to look at what Microsoft updated last Tuesday and start going at it. We already know they use automation to make it easy on themselves to go attack the infrastructures and find the vulnerabilities. But if we don't start becoming smart about how we're protecting that infrastructure, as we become, no, I'm gonna say this differently. As we become smarter in the way we protect that infrastructure, they're gonna to have to become smarter in the way they go after it. And I'll assure you, they're at the level of automation, right, on this level, you know they're gonna move up into artificial intelligence to help attack this infrastructure. Our opportunity is to start learning how to use AI to help protect our infrastructure, because if we don't, we'll be behind the eight ball again trying to catch up. There's the opportunity. If you are interested in the subject, Vlad, I'm sure, can get you a copy of this. These are the basic books, and I've even you know, given them five stars, four stars, three stars, and told you the sequence in which you, you should read them. If you're interested in this subject, uh, I would suggest you read at least the first one, and these are in alphabetical, but the first one is really the right one. Um, it's called Prediction Machines. It talks about the subject, it goes deeper than I go. If you're interested, that's where I would go. So, here's the real question. Are we living in a new age now? Are we living in a new age, much like we had, we've seen where it's materially changed our lives. So I'm not gonna answer that for you yet. I have a book coming out, hopefully later on in October, and we'll answer that question. But Einstein said logic will get you from A to B. We have our jobs to do every day. I don't anymore because I'm a professor at Columbia, but when I was running companies <laughs> and building them, I had our job. You all have your jobs to do. You've got to go from A to B every single day and get the job done. But I would ask you to please use your imagination about this subject because I, I think we need to start developing our ability to figure out how to use AI to protect this digital infrastructure we're now sitting on and running our businesses on. So with that, I will leave you. I will thank you for your patience because the, the slides weren't functioning. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it helps you in your thinking. I hope it puts context in how we're dealing with these subjects today. If you have any questions, that's my email address. I would welcome them because they always help us taking our thinking further and further. So with that, I will end. I'm sorry I overstayed my welcome, so I don't have the ability to answer questions. But again, if you have any, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much.